regular meeting of the Surrey uh, Health District Board of Directors. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask everybody to silence their cell phones in the first few years. So the phone call um, and the first order here on the list is citizen input. Does anybody there's a couple new faces here? Can you identify yourself? Let's see, we'll start with you. My name is Stephanie Martin. I'm the president of Casorio. Okay. And here's Kara. Hi, Do you have something you want to say? Or? I do. Well, oh, go ahead. Um, I work in, in survey research. I do contract work for the U.S. government overseas in Africa. I am actually here because I'm very concerned about your use of survey data. This five-star survey thing is you need to really take a second look at it. What you're measuring is a really narrow piece of the healthcare that Curry Health Network provides. All of the questions, none of them ask about outcomes. None of them ask, ask about people's ability to pay. You have a ridiculously low response rate. In our surveys, we don't report out until we're at 90%. You guys are at 28%. It's one in four people you tried to talk to gave you an answer. It doesn't tell you anything. You can't say you're a four-star anything based on these. It's a really, really poor performance measure. Could, could uh, Jenny, do you want to say anything to that or address that? And yes, the, as you know, the results are a year old and you're down to three stars. So what does that mean? Not much. Well, if I may, we don't assign ourselves the star rating. I understand that. Yeah, the Centers of Medicaid and Medicare provide that star rating based on their survey. And that, that survey and other things, clinical outcomes, process measures that we submit to the state. So we are reporting what CMS would say compared to other look at these results a lot more closely. Absolutely. And we pay a lot of attention to our, our satisfaction results. Uh, we are working hard to increase our response rate, absolutely. Um, so that's the onus is not you, it's on this survey to increase the response rate. But it, as far as the, the, the star rating itself, it is based on CMS's survey. I have no influence over those questions. It's not that, it's the way you guys are using the data. It's incredibly misleading. It pops up on your website. We're a four star thing. We are. What? We are higher than the state, we are higher than the nation. You can't even do those statistical tests and you until you have an adequate response. Well, if it's look, really misleading. If you look at the CMS website. I did. Yeah. I've downloaded the data. I've looked at all the information you guys should But they are the ones that assign that rating. I understand that. But they're not doing a good job and then you're just carrying the message further. I should go. Thank you. Uh, sure. I'm Don Euler, also reside in Pistol River. Uh, I just have questions about, it's really a comment about the packet that gets presented and sent um, us as public are able to see. Does anybody go and review the data for accuracy and completeness? Or is it just each individual contributor that provides it and that gets compiled? Which packet are you talking about? The package that gets put on your website. Yes. Uh, your, the question is, uh, if I understand it, is the packet that is posted on the website, does anybody look at it besides? Uh, Each department that supplies information to it and then somebody compiles it and puts it. Um, there's quite a few people. Uh, the, the financial information is uh, compiled by Carl and his group, but it's reviewed by a board committee prior to this meeting, in a finance committee meeting. That didn't happen yesterday, I believe. We didn't have a quorum, but we did have a meeting where we sat and okay, discussed. So I was misled. Pardon? So I was misled, because that's the package that I see that has the most need for review. Uh -huh. well, that, that meeting is on the Tuesday, uh, usually at 3.30, the day before this meeting, every month. So I, I was led to believe it was canceled because you didn't. So maybe there's one. I, I, I would but think. did you find anything in error? In that back. Uh, we had questions, yes. Same with the quality. Yeah. Some yeah. committee for quality too. We, we have four committees. I understand that. Okay. Then what's your question? 
We are financially audited by an external firm at the end. Much later, I mean, you've got to make decisions based on what you see out of Carl's reports, and that's one of the major metrics that drives anything. Absolutely. Uh, yes, to, to uh, I guess the, the, the point I'd make here is that all this stuff is, is uh, thoroughly vetted before it goes on. In fact, um, you'll find that we don't really discuss it in great detail here at these meetings because we've already well, been discussing it in detail today. Well, I do un understand that, but I'm also seeing that you're potentially going to put it on the consent instead of having it there so hopefully all of the board the would then be at that subcommittee meeting for the fiduciary responsibility as a board member. Yes, there's discussion about that, but that's not coming from well, the committee. One. It's only coming from the CFO that's recommending that we somebody what we're going to do. I don't know if that would happen. I can tell you from my perspective, I've been on the board now five years, I'm not sure, or maybe four. And the thoroughness of looking into our finances are far improved over what they were when I first came on. And that's thanks to people like Bo and Brian and, and our numbers guys that just really hammered and work hard at it and question it. And well, let me say this too. I mean, we're an organization that is not perfect, uh, but we're also an organization that is trying to optimize and re-optimize what we do and get better all the time. It's about continuous improvement. And if you wanted to pick up, pick any one of us here, you're going to be able to find something wrong with us. But together we're working as a team to try to make this the very best uh, rural health care that you can have in this country. And uh, that, that's our goal and that's our common uh, deal. So, uh, Thank you for being concerned you know, over that, though. Just, that's admirable, really. Yeah. Thank you. I encourage you to, if, to attend any of those committee meetings. It's not unusual that somebody from the public comes and sits in front of them. I would have been here yesterday if I thought it was going to be helpful. Okay. Is there anybody if, else here? If, if I may just clarify for yesterday, there was not a quorum of the needed number of committee members represented by the board, so the public meeting was canceled. Um, Bo came in and discussed the on his own as not part of the committee because we didn't have four. Thank you. She's our, uh, she keeps us in line. <laughs> okay. So, as uh, everyone has had a chance to read the minutes, we need to do that. Uh, are there any uh, changes, corrections, comments that anybody wants to make? Entertain a motion to approve these minutes. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes in the August 28th for me. There's a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So the next item of business is the consent agenda. So we have a policy approval and retirement or medical staff privileging. Our second quarter quality report, and board policy review. Any comments, questions, concerns about any of that? I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I so move. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The next item on the agenda is the medical staff report. And, uh, Jen, Jessica Carlson, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, so a medical staff meeting, um, you know, we're always trying to work on improving our policies and procedures. We didn't have too many changes this uh, last month, just kind of cleaning up some anesthesia policies and procedures, some lab standing orders, um, some peer review forms, things like that. 
just as far as new providers, we have Sarah Dickerson, um, who's been an ER nurse here for a long time, family nurse practitioner, we're finally getting all the paperwork and insurance credentialing completed for her. She'll be starting on November 4th. That's our anticipated start date for her. As you know, our urologist, Dr. Davis, is out on medical leave. We have uh, urologist, Dr. Mayer, who's been seeing patients in clinic in Brookings. He did two weeks worth of um, urology patient visits. Uh, it's my understanding that he'll kind of do a two weeks on, two weeks off. We're also discussing possibly bringing another urologist around and it's still to be determined. Um, we also have two new ER physicians that have been around doing a few shifts with us, Dr. Minkowski and Dr. Foby. Um, both have really excellent resumes and great experience at some huge hospitals, but also some smaller hospitals as well. Understand the rural feeling, but also have that great large hospital experience where they've seen a lot of crazy things. Um, so we're excited to have them on board in the emergency room as well. So I think that's the end for my report. Any questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next item, number six, monitoring superior performance is the August 2019 financial referral. Okay, four. Um, start with a summary of the income statement. Um, basically, the bottom line, the net margin was positive, which is good news, but much, much lower than the budget. And the primary causes were that the revenue was lower than the budget and contract labor was higher than the budget. Um, as a frame of reference, revenue was 9% below budget and 2% uh, greater than the prior year. So this is raised to the questions that we're addressing regarding the budget itself. Um, first thing I want to do is just take a look at the revenues because, you know, quite frankly, as I understand it, in terms of the finances that we deal with, the issue is the volatility of the revenue. And, and um, we've had some things happen recently that need to be discussed. Um, by and large, you can look at this, you can see that inpatient charges were 17% off the budget. And this is year to date, by the way, through August. Um, outpatient charges or gross revenue was 11% below the budget. And um, notice that inpatient charges were 20% below the prior year. Um, so the inpatient trend, as we've discussed before, continues in a downward slope. That is an industry trend, um, as is the migration to the outpatient side. Our outpatient charges, though, even though we're 11% below budget, we're 6% above prior year, which raises that budgeting question again. Um, net patient revenue is 8% off. We had some improvement in that number as a percentage of gross, um, simply because every month we do a look back, we look at the cash we actually collect, compare that with net revenues and net receivables, and make adjustments accordingly every now and then. We have a bit of a pickup, and you can see that there with a 57.1% ratio of net to gross, as opposed to what we budgeted was essentially a 55% ratio of net to gross. And, and, and again, there's volatility at the top side in terms of the charges. There's volatility there in terms of how we get paid, our payer mix, and how people pay us. Okay. Just for a uh, point of understanding. Mm -hmm. This, is this outside of the variation you would expect month to month when you, uh, I just listen to your terminology and I think that with the type of hospital size we are and the variability month to month and, and patient load, this is still within the norm, the variations that you're seeing, right? Um, the variability in the actual numbers, yes. Mm -hmm. The, the variance against budget, not so much, which mm -hmm. raises the budget question again. Yeah. Okay. But I guess the question then is, if it raises the budget question, are you saying that there may be a trend here that we have to keep our eyes on? There are things that have happened that we need to look at, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Great. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the statistics that drive the revenue. 
I hope you can see this. If not, I'll just tell you what's important on it. The first category is inpatient services. We measure the volume by patient days and the average daily census both are off by about 36%. Um, that's the trend. The current month had a very low average daily census. In the detailed budget, in the detailed board packet, we also provide you with a high, low, and median picture. And the, the low, the, those numbers were the lowest that I think I've seen since I've been here. So we had an August that was extremely low. And, and, it, and part of the issue when we're talking about variability is to what extent are these things controllable or not and understandable or not. And part of the issue with the small hospital in rural areas, there are things that happen we don't control. They're called acts of God. They're called fluctuations in epidemiology, in injury incidents. So we don't control it all. As an example, emergency room visits were up 22%. That, that in fact, in theory, if that's all you knew, you would bet that we would have had an increase in the inpatient census. Because about 90% of that census comes from the ER. But nope. Because we had a 53% decrease in the admissions rate from the ER. And we're still digging into if there was any explanation for that other than, as I said, not facetiously, act of God or fluctuations just naturally occurring. So we did not get the pickup on in the inpatient side that we would have expected from the increase in the emergency services side. Um, if we look at the outpatient service visits, the, the first category is ER visits, those are up, of course. But you look down here and you'll see that office visits were essentially flat. Those are the clinic visits that occur primarily at CMC and here for the primary cares. Um, urgent care visits, which is our same day walk-in, was uh, only up 1% over the prior 12-month average. And then, but the ancillary visits were up significantly, 4.4% over the 12-month average. Uh, it had a lot to do with um, how well we're doing in filling the pipeline when it comes to radiology. Is Sean here? No. There she is. How could I miss her? You guys are doing, really, you guys are doing a really good job of getting people in faster. And we measure that. We may have some statistics that people can challenge, but we do measure how long it takes us to go from an appointment to seeing a patient. They're doing a great job. Yep, you are. They are. Um, surgical services, um, inpatient surgical cases, that has dropped off over the year by, or over the years by at least half, um, and that's an industry trend. Um, outpatient surgical cases were down. The reason I highlight it is that's in general where our bottom line comes from. That is where we generate cash flow, and it's off 8%. Um, we also have end endoscopic procedures, which were up 9%. The, the, the problem with that, it's misleading because I would say the net revenue for endo cases is probably less than 20% per case of what it is for an outpatient surgical case. So what you have there is something that really affects revenue. See if there's anything else. Nope. Any board questions? Okay. All right. Revenue trend. Uh, this is something we didn't talk about yesterday in the finance committee. We talked about it, but I wanted to show it because it's 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 what I would call fundamental to uh, our business. That is the revenue trend. This is a trend in the gross charges. It starts in February of 2018 and runs through August of 2019. And I, I, I dropped a linear regression line through it. Um, you know, half decent R squared, actually, which means it, it's, it's a decent correlation. And then I also put in this wiggly line here is a um, three-month moving average. And, and what you can see is there is an upward trend steadily over the longer term. But you can also see a high degree of variability. And again, um, you've got yeah. December and then you've got Hushkin on in there. 
Mm -hmm. But so you're in December, you know it's going to be poor and it's going to be. But those are your two dips. I'm working on um, developing a, a simpler and, and smarter uh, uh, cash projection methodology. So I'm trying to understand why these things happen so that we can predict them or control them. One of the two, either control them or predict them. <coughs> and um, one of the things I'm finding is that um, there is just an inherent variability in the things we don't control. Now, the other thing, my notes here, which you can't see, which is probably a good thing, is that this, again, calls into question the value of trying to project individual monthly revenues. And I say that because in doing my analysis, what I did is, is suppose we just smooth the revenues on an average per month basis, same annual budget, smoothed out with the variance of BIM for July and August, 0.6%. So, yeah. so, summary of August causes for August revenue variances, delays in two key business initiatives, echocardiography, and um, I understand we had a demonstration of a new technology today, which we budgeted for. And uh, physical and occupational therapy in Brookings where we have uh, converted a conference room into a patient care room. And, and those of you who don't like bureaucracies will like that we took a room that's not used for meetings and turned it into patient care service. Um, but there's been delays in that. Also, call out the foundation for having raised over $20,000 for the equipment that's in there. That was a good thing as well. So, but there have been delays in those two things, so we have not seen any of the revenue um, uh, benefits that we budgeted for that. And then the uh, final thing which uh, Jessica spoke to was the unexpected absence of a specialist. And uh, again, we've talked about this when we did our budget hearings. We have we have thin bench. We don't we only have one player on each position, and when one of them's out, it hurts. Okay, I want to shift over and look at the expenses. And the reason I left the net operating revenue line in there is as a frame of reference, as a frame of reference, budget variance is a negative 9%. And we've talked before that what I would like to see is if revenue goes down, we can flex our expenses down. Um, and, and so we take a look at the percentage change in revenue and compare or the percentage variance in revenue and compare it with it percentage variance in the, in the uh, operating expenses. And unfortunately, the revenue budget was down 9%, almost 800 grand. The expenses were only down 2.8% or 230,000. So um, the expenses did not drop you know, in proportion to the revenues. Uh, and the cause is contract labor, period, pure and simple. If you took it out, if you replace that contract labor, which I did on the back of an envelope, with employed persons, pretty much takes the budget, balance the, the, the expense problem out. So there it is right there. And there's not a lot more that can be said about the expenses, because otherwise, we've been, we've been keeping the other expenses, the materials and service expenses, significantly lower. Uh, again, call out good management job for the folks who are here. Good job. Um, the, all that said, it still is true that the overall reason for the, the margins being off budget is because of the revenue variation. All right. This is a simple picture of, of the, uh, the blue or the revenues. The red are the expenses, and the green is the margin. And you can see that we've had, you know, a, more months of a positive margin than we've had a negative margin, which is good in the long haul. But otherwise, this is just a picture. Make it a nice t-shirt. Um, balance sheet. One thing I focus on is highlighted here, and that's the unrestricted fund balance. 
since it was has been our financial emphasis to you know grow our cash balance so that when we have things like this did not happen you know we, we, we uh, uh, persevere when we have uh, providers that are out that were unexpected we have cushion and so that's what we focus on cash um, what we have a change from the prior month of a negative eight hundred and sixty three thousand dollars Half a million dollars of that is due to the fact that we have three paydays in two months of the year. And one of them was a month. And when that happens, it causes a half a million dollar decline in the cash balance. Uh, days cash on hand ended up at about 33.3. And um, we'll talk about that on the next slide. And um, another metric that we use to discuss the health of the balance sheet is days of operating expenses accounts payables 14 which is pretty respectable uh, we're paying our vendors on time this is a picture of the um, a couple of metrics for cash flow the green line is the cash balance the red line is the days cash on hand which you can see in the box ends at 34 there's a reason it's not 33.3, and that is because on this, I include capital expenditures. Uh, the, on the balance sheet discussion, that's a formally defined accounting term for days cash on hand. I quite frankly prefer this one because we're planning we pay out capital, capital expenditures, that's cash flow out. At any rate, um, the, the thing of concern on this is that the, uh, the lower line, the blue line, is the budget for days cash on hand. And uh, it is below, we are now below that. And this is the first time that's happened since this graph's been done. You can see that the, uh, the red line's always been above the blue until this last month. So, and that, that's equivalent to $70,000 that we're under budget for cash. And the final slide are our key financial ratios. Um, we usually don't have a lot to say about these, but kind of consistent with um, what I was just describing, we have two reds, and red being signaling that we're in a downward trend quarterly, and those are the total margin and the day's cash on hand. Are there any questions? If I try to draw a glittering generality and you say, take everything you've done, you count the lazy divide by four. What I'm hearing is cash is less than what you would like it to be and what you invite it to be. So I presume you are taking pains to look at this very carefully because you're lower cash than you would otherwise be. But you don't see anything that makes you at this point at least, think that there's a substantial change you need to make in the budget. This is within the variability that you would expect. The well, I, I mean, if I, if I respond to you literally, you're right. But, um, you know, at this point in time, mm -hmm. means this afternoon, what I'm doing is I'm working on, you know, as I said, you know, a, a, a simplified, but let's just call it analytically robust cash mm -hmm. projection methodology. And I say that because we can't keep having this be a mystery. And it can't mm -hmm. be lots of rows and columns on the spreadsheet that drives this. But at the same time, we can't look at month-to-month -month variations and draw big conclusions from it either. That's that You have to have correct. some sort of smoothing function to go back and say, yep. this is significant or not significant, or do we just have to watch out for some things here? Yes. That's why I, it, it's, it's, it's not it's not just geek terminology when I say I'm concerned about the budget by month. Because for example, we expected August, based on prior August, to be a great month. Mm -hmm. Well, you just saw August was not only not a great month, meaning it didn't follow the prior year patterns. It was a bad month. Mm -hmm. What that means is the gap between the budget and August is really large. We experienced that in March when we had a Uskanon. March is almost always a very busy month. March was not a busy month, and therefore the gap exceeded a million bucks, which was also. I guess, I guess what I'm saying is you can't look at a month, the actuals versus budget, and draw a lot of conclusions. 
because it's just the nature of the business we're in, depending on whether we have more people coming into an emergency room, depending on whether we have surgical procedures versus lower, lower profit procedures. Um, and I guess, because what we're trying to do on a board level here is look at these things and draw conclusions about things we should be doing strategically. And even though there's some variability here, I guess my conclusion is I'm not worried about strategic effects. I'm saying that these are more tactical or month to month effects. And I'm asking you, do you have any worries about the budget being a problem, that we were too optimistic, or that there's any trends here we need to worry about? Uh, I, I'm always worried about our ability to retain um, key providers. Mm -hmm. I'm always worried about how long it takes to replace key providers. And um, so, yeah, but I'm always worried about that. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, depending on which person, which provider, it, it changes. But that is the nature of our job here. More than anything else is to keep the right base of providers here over time. And, um, that so yeah I'm worried about that strategically yes I am mm -hmm. and and I think that we'll see whether or not the cap the revenue projections that I'm doing lead us to any conclusions that we might want to revise our budget I can't tell you that right now you know but it wouldn't surprise me mm -hmm. it wouldn't surprise me at all in fact it would be in my business sense, it would make sense to do that revision if we saw stuff in there that said, oh, you know, looks like we have a, we have an issue here. But you're not ready to raise any flags right now? Not today. Any other questions or comments here from the board? Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point, I'll entertain a motion to well, I just have a really quick question. I'm here. You said rent increase due to a new property lease in Brookings. Hemlock Building for the um, um, schedulers, the prior authorization oh, folks. We in the call center. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That makes sense. And we're out of the rush. Yeah, we don't use the brush building. The, 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 the rent on but I mean, the, the lease. The agreement the lease is no? ends in February. The impact of that's fourteen point three thousand dollars a month. Yikes! Okay. Thanks. Counting down. Counting down. Counting down. Yeah, it's painful. Okay. Any other questions? So I'll entertain a motion to approve the August 2019 financial report. I so move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Next item is the uh, community external relations uh, 3.1 of our uh, policy. Uh, Jim has submitted her. Uh, Report on that, and it's only for discussion. We'll take action next month uh, as far as approving it. Is there any discussion about this? Is that chance you need it? Okay. Uh, Jim, you're going to have to. You did a better job. I had a question, Jenny, about uh, after the board meetings. So, tomorrow, what do you do? Tomorrow, and we haven't been holding these over the summer months because they we really have only had two or three people attend. Um, but typically, the the day following the board meetings here during the lunch hour, I'll meet with any community members that want to come in and talk about either what occurred at the board meeting or get updates from me or just kind of chat about things that are working or not working. It's an intimate group, and it's get definitely gotten smaller and smaller. Um, what about work? And you go down there on Fridays, right? No, nope, we haven't done that for a long time because no one ever showed up. We I went, I went yes. twice, no one anybody there. No, there was nobody there. Mm -hmm. Mm 
one of the recommendations from AMP and PR, and if I could get them to re-engage with me, they've been really radio silent. I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, they made a recommendation that we establish a, a community leadership um, cohort, if you will, um, comprised of uh, community members from all three locations and to hold uh, regular meetings with them to share what's going on and what's specifically happening in their communities um, and, and kind of expand what I'm doing here in Gold Beach, but do it by invitation. And so uh, that's definitely something I want to explore more. And that's one of the problems of getting the word out of what is going on is what's happening to people that come in on a regular basis. Okay, so there's any more discussion on that? Okay, we'll move to the next uh, item on the agenda, page 7. Jane, the floor is yours. So I want to share a couple of really positive things with the board. Um, the first is that uh, after a couple of really long, hard months with uh, a variety of team members from the business office to our coding department to our frontline staff and our management team, they have been working really, really hard to build our emergency department information system. And last week we were able to go live on that system. It just so happened right after we went live, we lost the power for four hours. <laughs> so it tested us a little bit. Uh, but I have to say, and that implementation went as smooth as any implementation I have ever seen in an emergency room where you are literally taking people from a paper process and having them document straight onto the computer. Uh, that doesn't happen by chance. It only happens when there is great preparation, great buy-in, and great teamwork. So I really, um, I'm very, very proud of that. Um, and um, I've been around places where after one day, when you turn a system on in the emergency room, they turn it off. So I've seen bad, bad things happen, and, and this was a real success story for us. Um, the second positive thing that I'd like to share, and I'd really like to sh thank uh, Carl and, and his wife Sandra for um, spearheading this, although it was kind of last minute hurry up and, and get this done, and that was partially my fault. There was a community health and wellness uh, event put on by Don. Don, I can't remember her last name. Van Dorf. Thank you, Van Dorf. We all know Don somehow. We've ridden on her bikes or something. Uh, anyway, uh, we attended and had a booth um, that was staffed by our um, physical therapists and um, about 150 people attended but Carl actually went around and, and, and held up this sign and walked around and wore shorts so that he could share his experience of his knee replacement here and it, again it's to promote and have that business development <laughs> at a community level oh, about the services. <laughs> we Did you think of that Carl? Cheryl and I thought of that. That is Anybody very... Anybody show up your legs, sir? Carl thought of it. That is very... We have the TV there, so I'm not going to do it. I also really want to thank Cheryl. You know, Cheryl gets last-minute requests all the time from folks, and um, when she knows it's a, a valuable, important thing to do, she just digs in like all of us and gets it done. And I really, um, I really commend all of them for taking their time, volunteering on a Saturday to do that. So it was really a, a fun attended event. Not only that, we did win, Fair Health Network won the most healthy dessert. Uh, they had a healthy dessert, uh, uh, what do I call it? A healthy dessert contest. contest. Yeah. And um, Sandra made a, a chocolate mousse out of tofu. I can't imagine how that would taste any good, but <laughs> people loved it and uh, they were gone. And, and she won, so uh, congratulations and thank you very much. Um, one last thing I would like to share, and this comes from a patient directly unsolicited uh, last Sunday. You know, Sundays I try to start connecting back with work. I start looking at emails and I dreadfully go to Facebook. I'm not a social media person, but I do check that out. And sure enough, there was a, um, a string of posts from a patient that took their child to the emergency room and what superb care that they received and um, how timely everything was, how well they were treated. And in the past, we've seen a lot of these start out well, but then kind of go sideways where people are sharing. 
the opposite of that. But in this situation, there was more than 20 posts, and really most of them were very, very positive. And when somebody did speak about uh, something that wasn't quite right, it was from a long time ago. So um, I do think we are making progress. Um, I continue to hear about it from the patients I round it on. If you happen at these, you know, in our hospital for some reason, um, we are hearing very good things from our patients individually as I round on them. So I wanted to share that. <clears throat> Moving on, a um, couple of things. Uh, HB 5050, this is the uh, House bill that included Curry Health Network uh, in uh, the ability to obtain lottery funds uh, in the uh, sum of $2 million to help us get the emergency room open. Um, when we reached out to the state to learn about that funds, how we could access them, when we could access them, um, we were told that the lottery funds actually don't fund until the spring of 2021. And um, we had a meeting with <coughs> Representative David Brocksmith and Senator Dallas Hurd and the, lobby, the lobbyists that uh, we hired to understand how this could have happened uh, because the lobbyists uh, in their discussions while they were in Salem had always intended for that funding to come from the general fund. And my understanding from them is that the general fund is much less restrictive and much more readily available. Um, so David and um, Dallas went back into session last week up in Salem and I did uh, get an email forwarded to me from Bo from David Broxwith that said, they were able to work with Senator Johnson. They do believe they will be able to uh, switch the funding source, but there's a process that they'll need to go through and that will not take place until February. Again, there are no promises. They're saying they think it can happen and there is a process and it won't happen until February. So um, that's kind of the latest on the funding from the state for the emergency room as it stands today. Um, and I forwarded all of you uh, that email. Um, and then uh, I, I just want to make clear too, uh, last month we were once again on the front page under the county commissioner's um, meeting. Um, I want to be clear with the public and, the, and this board, I did not request uh, the county commissioners consider lending Curry Health Network any money from the road funds. Um, uh, Commissioner Pash did call me the Saturday after we learned about HB 5050 not being available until 2021 said I'd like to help if we can. I'd like to discuss this as a concept with the commissioners. I said that would be great, start that discussion if you will. But obviously, if there was any direction that came from this board, we would go through the, uh, the process that's required by the county to obtain a loan from them. Again, that would only come from the direction of you. And I just wanted to be clear with that because in the newspaper, I wasn't, I said to Chris when he said he was going to have the meeting that I could not attend, I couldn't be present. He said, don't worry about it. I should have known better uh, because the conversation just kind of took off and I had really no ability to weigh in on that or to redirect the conversation. Um, and so it, it was what it was, but I just want to be clear. I haven't asked for those funds. And this was one county commissioner that wanted to have a discussion with his fellow commissioners about should we, could we, would we, if they needed the money. So um, I wanted to be upfront and honest about that. Um, we talked about EDIS already. Uh, provider recruitment, uh, Dr. Uh, Carlson touched on a lot of it, but I do want to just give you an update that we currently have an exclusive arrangement with uh, a radiology group out of Eugene. They're, they're called RAPSI. It stands for Radiology Associates. Okay, Sean, do you remember? Oh, she took off. Anyway. PC. I don't know. Yeah. No, she, physician Corp. I don't know what they stand, stand for. Anyway, great radiology group. They do all of the readings for us, but they couldn't actually ever have a radiologist here on site. They, were, they didn't have the staff to do it. The group of radiologists um, that was taking care of Bay Area Hospital with an exclusive arrangement has actually closed their doors and their physicians are all going their own ways. Dr. Michelis was one of those physicians. Um, as I learned more about Michelis, her reputation is very, very good, and Rapsi was uh, very glad to hear that she had an interest in joining our network. They did actually send me um, an amendment to the contract that will allow her to bill and collect for any procedures that she does or for any images that she reads while she's working her shift here uh, with us. And so that really allows us to expand services to the public. Um, currently, we have to send all of our biopsies. 
out. Uh, so if you need a breast biopsy, a thyroid, a lung, a liver, any of those, uh, those all leave. And typically when a patient leaves your health system for those initial services, they get fed to another hospital and have surgery. So Dr. Carlson will be a little bit busier. Um, and we will be entering into contract and bringing Dr. Michelis on. It'll take a little while, you guys. It takes about 90 days for the payers to get these physicians fully credentialed, but we are very, very excited. This is a service we used to provide here. Medford Radiology Group used to put a physician here one day a week. Uh, it wasn't enough. We definitely uh, filled that schedule. And, it, and what it did was it lined patients up. So their theory was line everybody up on that one day. Well, if you've been if you've got some suspect situation, nobody wants to be lined up or wait a week or two. And so doc, by having Dr. Michelis here three or four days a week, will really make those services readily available. And, and we are excited about that. Um, I'm not gonna go into a, a ton of other provider recruitment other than to tell the board that we really are aware that we need to be um, actively recruiting for a full-time urologist to replace Dr. Davis. Um, and um, other primary care physicians, whether it's internal medicine or otherwise. We've got a great complement of family nurse practitioners and PAs, but we really need to bolster um, our medical staff physician uh, population, especially when you start to look at the age of our medical staff. It's definitely older than the average age in the country, which means people will be retiring, and we need to really plan for those things. So we're actively um, working on, on those positions too. Um, I'm pleased to announce that we had our uh, Oregon Health Authority was here this week or last week, I can't, last week, late last week. Uh, they come here annually to review our policies and procedures as it would relate to the 12-hour hold and transfer certificate that we hold. Um, our survey, they were a few minor findings. We'll be working to close those gaps. We'll submit a plan of correction, but really by and large, they were very, very pleased and commented on the processes that we put into place and the progress that we've made as a community to uh, really take care of those individuals that um, have mental illness and they're in a crisis whereby they are at, at risk of harming themselves or others. So we're pleased that that's done with. I have a few other things that I just want to give a verbal update on. Um, we are working with uh, SWAC um, and in the Brookings campus to um, make available a, um, a what's called a business administration um, certificate course. It's a nine month course. Um, it has nine different topics that they'll discuss with uh, our management team, that those that are volunteering. Uh, the cost is nominal and um, they will tailor this uh, certification course if we were to get a cohort of say eight or 10 of our management managers or leads that we, we know have potential to be future managers, we'll enroll them in this, this uh, program. They'll go down to SWAP one day a month. They'll be in class from like nine to 3.30. They'll have some homework and do some projects together. Uh, but we really think that this is a wonderful way to educate our future leadership and, and some of our current management team uh, at, a, at a very nominal be in and local, so uh, we were you say something about certification? It is a, cert it's a certificate program. So I do not believe it's a living certificate, meaning you have to continue to get continuing education to recertify. It is a one-time certificate that these folks will receive. It is really, really nice. I want to make you aware, too, <clears throat> this has been um, a very recent um, uh, situation that's been unfolding. Um, the um, coordinated care organizations known as the CCOs have been um, working with the Oregon Health Authority to renew their contracts and in such um, Oregon Health Authority uh, has placed some significant um, requirements on the CCOs and depending on their application for uh, their, uh, their agreement, if you will, it is a binding agreement that they have with the state. Um, certain CCOs were granted a five-year agreement and others a one-year. And those that were granted a one-year were given a plan of correction, meaning you need to close these gaps before we can offer you further services. My understanding is there are certain CCOs that were in jeopardy of, of getting that agreement, uh, but for the fact that if they didn't renew their agreements, these counties would go unserved um, for the Medicaid population. 
Advanced Health, however, was one of the CCOs that was granted a five-year agreement, um, and in their agreement with the Oregon Health Authority required any, indi any individual entity that contracts with them to provide services to their patient population would be required to do a number of things. One of these is an unfunded six or seven hour education, series of educational classes that includes all of our staff. And they want us to complete it before this, the end of this calendar year. And when I heard that just last week, I jumped on the phone with Advanced Health and made it very clear that this is a financial hardship to this organization. Not only am I paying 280 full-time staff members to attend six hours of training, it was not budgeted for, not understood. For providers, that takes them out of time of patient care. There's a revenue impact to us as well. Um, I'm, I am pleased Advanced Health does understand that this is a hardship and that it is a big ask. They are working with me towards an answer to this. Uh, but it, the initial, just the outlay of the cost to educate all of those people with no overtime is about $75,000. So it's not an insignificant amount of money or time. Um, so we're working through the details on that and I'm sure we'll come to a, a reasonable um, end point, if you will. Um, I do believe that the training is probably very valuable and meaningful, so I'm not suggesting that it's not time worth spending. Uh, it's just, it's unbudgeted and unfunded at this point in time. Is that by uh, Oregon Health Authority? That, that was placed in the Oregon Health Authority's agreement with Advanced Health. And so now Advanced Health is coming back and telling all parties that have a contract with them, you will comply with this. So there's hardships. You know, I, I haven't reached out yet to the Bay Area Hospital CEO. John Burles and I are kind of exchanging emails trying to find a time. Um, they are equally distraught about this unfunded mandate. They're larger than we are, uh, people-wise and dollar-wise. So um, again, Advanced Health is being very responsive. They understand, and uh, I, I think that we'll, we'll come to a meaningful end. But in the end, of, at the end of the day, Oregon Health Authority has that in their contract with them, and they must abide by it. So um, we will figure it out, and I'm, I'm very confident about that. Uh, and the only other thing I want to mention is there is another community outreach that we are going to proudly participate, and that is the Gold Beach Youth Fundraiser. We'll be playing Cornwall on October 13th. I can't remember the teams. I know Carl's not on mine. Um, I'm on Christina Martin's team. Yep, the whole admin team is participating. We are a proud sponsor for that event. So please come out and cheer us on. Um, or, you know, throw eggs, whatever you want to do. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, you yeah. throw bean bags. Sorry, yeah. throw yeah. bean bags, not eggs. So, <laughs> so I shouldn't misinterpret what you're saying. No, please, <laughs> leave the eggs alone. That concludes my report. Lots to talk about. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're back to the citizen input part. Is there any more? Any I have story? comments on the financial presentation. Sure. I don't think that he did a well that a regression is not the appropriate tool for I'm analysis. sorry, I can't understand what you're saying. Um, it's about the financial yes. presentation. Regression analysis, which he presented the R square number from, is the way you did it is not appropriate for time series because you have be, I mean, I you know what i would love to debate that with you that's fine yes. our square is not a offline okay just and the other thing is as a general presentation rule red green can't be seen by colorblind people so it's better to put something else in your presentation. I'm color blind, and i struggle with that so thank, thank you, you. <laughs> <laughs> but but i look at the lines any other comments? Thank you, Stephanie. Okay. So, uh, next item is uh, to talk about a quarterly review if the, we need to do a supplemental budget. And that's uh, something I think that Carl is concerned about. Uh, so, we put that on the table personally. Uh, I don't think that we need to do that quarterly. I think we need to watch it and, and we get into the spring. And that's when we would want to be talking about doing a supplemental budget. But to do a supplemental budget every quarter or even this early to me seems 
the poetry that you said. But yeah, my only worry is that November and December have a tendency to be low months, and um, you now watch the cash. I guess that's only more than that between now and the end of the year. Well, you know, Bo's advocated for a rolling 12-month uh, forecast, and my understanding of that is that's cash. That's a Treasury management function, which is what I'm working on right now to update that, and I you know, probably a couple of weeks out from getting that to the point where management's had a chance to review it and see whether or not, you know, there's anything we need to respond to. So the timing of that is going to depend on what we find. And, and, and yeah, that's kind of where I... So we'll be, we'll be talking about it next week. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I'll bring forward the, what the cash projections show so that you can see what the numbers say. Well, the only the only way we have to strengthen our balance sheet is through cash. Mm -hmm. we, we, we can't borrow any of that money. We're, we're so highly leveraged that we just we have to be conservative about just about everything we're doing, and we've got to build cash. So, uh, and, and that's been where we've been for three. Four years since Jimmy got here. We made great, improvement, great strides last year. Uh, we have a little bit of setback right now. Uh, we'll see what happens in the next few months. That's my two bits, but we'll revisit it next month. Okay. Um, upcoming board meetings. What's the next? Okay. So we had uh, anybody notice about uh, let's see, October is a regular meeting, but it's going to be in total regular schedule. It's a week early. Well, oh, it is a week early. 18th, I think. Was it? 23rd, 23rd, that's right. 23rd, 23rd. Yeah. 23rd of October. Is there a chance financials won't be done by then? No, they'll be done. Okay. And I, I won't be able to attend that. So. Right, Holly? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the next meeting is uh, the 20th of November. Are we in quarter for October or November? Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, November, we're in quarter for November. thank you. Cold Beach, in October. And then, and that's a week earlier than normal because of Thanksgiving. And then in December, we're a week earlier on the 18th of December, and that's here at Cold Beach, and that's because of Christmas. I'll have to check. Twenty at four, yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. So the next three months are a week early. It's never good. Okay. Come come January we'll be we'll be back to our normal schedule. Okay, so December again is December is the eighth. That eighteenth. It's right here in the back. Page thirty three. Okay. Page thirty three. Subcommittee meets uh, the day before the regular monthly uh, board meeting. And then the quality meeting, the next meeting is on the 18th of December at 3 p.m. Okay, so Don, if you're interested in coming to that, that's what time is that on the 3rd? Mm -hmm. 3.30. No, the 3.30. And it's here all the time, even when you're in Port Arthur? Yeah. No. Oh, the day before. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, the finance. <laughs> yeah. The finance meeting is always yeah. Yeah. in this in this room right here. Unless we don't have a quorum, our, our chair was who was on the committee who is was in Chicago. He could be here next year. And that's a rare thing. I think mm -hmm. we we probably it's ten out of twelve. We'll have that meeting. 
Okay. Other meetings. Um, so we're talking about uh, attending the Estes Park uh, Institute uh, the 1st of March to the 4th of March. Uh, there'll be more information given to us on that. So we can explain it. And then the holiday party is uh, December 7th at the Lucky 7 Casino in Crescent City. That's the place they had it last year. <laughs> That's what the employees wanted. Mm -hmm. not, they're they're yeah. less they're organizing it. Thanks, everybody.